ya que el mismo está integrado tanto por actividades esencialmente académicas de la institución teórico-metodológica como por actividades culturales que involucran a la comunidad de Ciudad Juárez y del Parque. Es decir, el foro tiene un sentido social que desea mantener el conjunto de actividades en un constante diálogo en los complejos procesos de la generación del conocimiento y de su intercambio social. Deseamos que en él se cumplan los objetivos planteados y que sirvan de estímulo para la realización eh, de otros eventos que vengan a fortalecer las relaciones interinstitucionales dentro de este campo del saber. Y no me resta sino felicitarlos por este gran esfuerzo y desear que eh, las actividades de este foro fructifiquen y sean eh, lo más generosas posible para el enriquecimiento académico de nuestra institución. Gracias. Bien, así declarados, eh, formalmente inaugurados los trabajos de este foro, pues eh, quisiéramos agradecer a todos los miembros del presidium haber estado en esta ceremonia y haberla presidido. Muchísimas gracias, señores altas personalidades de las instituciones convocantes y organizadoras de este foro que el día de hoy inicia aquí en Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, pero con participantes en otras partes del país y en otras partes del extranjero. Este foro académico binacional, cruzando fronteras cinematográficas, historia y futuro. Les damos la más cordial de las bienvenidas a los trabajos, personas que nos acompañan tanto aquí en Ciudad Juárez como en las otras sedes del foro. Quisiéramos a continuación presentar la primera ponencia en este foro. Y con esto iniciaremos las actividades la conferencia magistral será por parte de la representación de Estados Unidos, el doctor Gary Keller, de la Universidad Estatal de Arizona, que presenta a continuación la ponencia An Overview of the Binational History of Cooperation Between the Americans and Mexican Film Establishment. Eh, panorama de la historia binacional de cooperación en los establecimientos del cine mexicano y norteamericano. Recibimos al doctor Gary Keller a continuación de la Universidad Estatal de Arizona. Una de rojo. Pero ni siquiera no la ah, ya. Uh, Pero uh, ojalá vamos a tener tiempo para preguntas y observaciones y discusiones. Y uh, sin confianza, háblenme en, en español o en, o, o en inglés y uh, podemos uh, charlar uh, un poco sobre esto, platicar. Voy a uh, utilizar la ocasión de, de esta conferencia para mencionar que... Eh, traje conmigo eh, una copia de los cuatro libros que, que yo he publicado eh, sobre el cine chicano, este que se llama Cine Chicano, del, de, publicado por la Cineteca, Cineteca Nacional, eh, y su versión eh, en inglés que se llama Chicano Cinema, Research Reviews and uh, Resources. Este más reciente, 1994 creo, es el primer tomo que acompaña a este. Estos realmente uh, son, uh, son uh, tomos relacionados con el índice en este libro para los dos. Este se llama Hispanic in the United States Film, an Overview and Handbook. Este es muy, muy reciente. Very few people have seen this one. It's only about six months old. A Biographical Handbook of Hispanics in the United States Film. Mucho de lo, de lo que voy a discutir eh, se trata de, oh, uh, 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 se puede encontrar a, a veces con más uh, detalle en este libro y, y uh, en este. Así que si les interesa este tipo de cosas, uh, les interesa lo que les voy a decir, uh, pueden uh, quizá consultar estos 
libros. No, no es exactamente lo mismo, sin embargo, porque, porque eh, sobre lo que voy a hablar es, es una investigación más reciente, bueno, estoy trabajando en esto uh, al día. Y después, uh, well, with, with uh, Professor Victor Marquez's uh, help, it might be able to purchase these things. Uh, I only brought one copy of these, of these but I think he's going to make them available. I will have to ask him how to, that might work. There's a couple of copies extra of these in my suitcase, which I left at the hotel in El Paso. But uh, you certainly can help yourself to one of these uh, flyers and, and order these things uh, separately. And the few catalogs that we have left, you can help yourself to genocide them. Well, I think that does it for the um, introduction, except that uh, <coughs> I would say that uh, uh, Eso, eso lo ven bien, ¿verdad? Okay. ¿Perdone? Ajá. Ahí también, ¿verdad? ¿eh? Pero ahí arriba, ¿qué? Ah, muy bien. Ok. Con eso no vamos a tener que entrar entonces con los papelitos. Uh, <coughs> ¿Sabes qué? ¿Me ayuda? Yo te doy con una nueva, con una nueva, con una nueva. Okay. Esta, esta realmente van a ser como 10 o 15 minutos o antes de que sea importante, ¿verdad? ¿Ok? ¿En dónde está yo? Oh, just the last thing is that uh, I want to apologize to you. Uh, I'm here uh, just, to, just because my good friend Dennis asked me to come, but this is a really extremely hectic time for me. I'm the director of the Hispanic Research Center at Arizona State University. And we're giving a large international conference with many uh, Mexican scholars on December 8th through the December 12th at Arizona State University in Phoenix. So I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave this afternoon. I have to go back to my own uh, uh, work uh, getting this conference uh, together, which is in only uh, uh, three weeks. But um, let's begin. And. Uh, uh, what I'm going to concentrate on, because an entire history of uh, cooperation, binational cooperation between uh, American and, and Mexican film would take us uh, a couple of years. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on three important instances. One, technological, the first, uh, at the moment, like uh, Crucijada, of uh, the transition from uh, cine mudo from, from, from silent film to uh, sound film. Secondly, uh, a political, all of these things are interwoven. They're political, they're technological, stylistic. But the first one is primarily technological. The second one is primarily political. And it relates to the uh, uh, achievement of uh, premier status on the part of Mexican film. Uh, as a result of the Second World War. And then the third is stylistic, and it relates to the establishment of uh, the Gabriel Figueroa, Emilio Lindo Fernandez uh, style of cinematography, which we associate with the golden age of Mexican uh, cinema and its export uh, throughout the world. That also has a very strong technological element. So we're going to do a little bit of technology, a little bit of politics, and a little bit of stylistics. And uh, I also have quite a bit of information about the careers of Mexican uh, uh, filmmakers, actors and actresses, and so on, uh, from a binational uh, point of view. I probably won't go into that in much detail, but if you want to know stuff, ask me questions, and during the question and answer period, I can, I can uh, 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 deal with that. But uh, it's, it's a topic that could go on forever. So let's, uh, let's begin here. Uh, as we know, the United States-Mexican border places into contact one of the wealthiest and most developed countries in, in the world with a country that uh, uh, is only recently developing in terms of contemporary economic uh, uh, measures. There's no other international boundary 
uh, which juxtaposes uh, such a wealthy and industrialized country with a uh, uh, developing one. And so this region qualifies as what is known as a shatter zone, an area of the culture of which is the result not of assimilation, uh, but of the often, often troubled relationship of unequal partners. From a filmic point of view, more precisely, a North American, uh, United States filmic point of view, Charlie Chaplin's movie, The Pilgrim, 1923, is instructive. I don't know if you've seen the film. Uh, but the film has Charlie Chaplin getting out of prison. He's a hustler. He's a con man. And the first scene uh, is him getting out of prison. And then he returns to a life uh, of crime as a con man. The sheriff catches uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin and takes him to the United States-Mexican border and kicks him across the border to the Mexican side. And the last shot is Charlie Chaplin with that very distinctive walk of his uh, with one foot on either side of the border. So he's walking with one foot on either side of the border uh, in the horizon uh, in his usual gait. On the American side, they're doing all these productive things, like ranching, mining, construction, building, and so on. And on the Mexican side, uh, on the Mexican side, uh, bandits are shooting uh, with each other. A sort of cliche, conventional image of the United States-Mexican border, 1923. Todo este trabajo contradice eso, contradice esa imagen convencional y cliché. Uh, so this paper is dedicated to exploring a less conventional, a more counterintuitive topic. Uh, the cooperation between Mexican and United States interests in the creation of film. Now there are many such examples, and they begin very early. <clears throat> For example, in 1913 with the Mexican Revolution, uh, and include such examples as Pancho Villa's role as an actor playing himself, as well as a choreographer in uh, Raul Walsh's The Life of General Villa of 1914. Pancho Villa was uh, uh, so interested in film and the publicity that film could give that um, he worked closely with Walsh, who at that time became a very famous uh, uh, director, Raul Walsh. Uh, at that time was an assistant for D.W. Griffith, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the most important person in terms of technology and stylistics of, uh, of world uh, film, and of course somewhat infamous person for his uh, directing uh, The Birth of a Nation. So in 1913, Griffith sent uh, Walsh to Mexico. He came here through Ciudad Juarez, uh, and he uh, united himself with Pancho Villa. And in 1913, Pancho Villa won the Battle of Durango, La Batalla de Durango, de 1913. But Walsh complained that he didn't, you know, he was trying to do something in real life, in real time. He complained that he didn't get good footage because it was, like, it was over, like, really quickly. So Pancho Villa had the movie restaged uh, dramatically. This was already a, a, pretty, a pretty common tradition in, in, in filmmaking. And you see it as early as the beginning of film, 1898, the Battle of Manila Bay, the sinking of the Maine in 1898. There's restagings of those films in 1898. And so um, uh, Pancho Villa had some uh, women, for example, of uh, somewhat slightly uh, uh, controversial fame, dressed and throwing flowers and, and, and welcoming the army into uh, Durango. And uh, what he had was his own Dorados uh, put on the uniforms of the federales that they had killed. And so they played, he divided his army into two groups. Uh, uh, the Dorados played the Federales, who got beaten by the Dorados, and it was a superb movie, made a lot of money. Uh, <clears throat> and 
then there's a, another scene in there of uh, a mass release of prisoners from the penitentiary who pay homage to Pancho Villa, to the Atila del Norte. Quite an interesting movie. Um, let me now turn to uh, one of the critical things I want to talk to talk about, uh, and that is the collaboration between Hollywood and the Mexican film world at the advent of the sound period. Uh, namely 1928, 1929. That's when movies very quickly, uh, at least in the United States, moved to uh, sound. In places like China, uh, it takes three or four additional uh, years. Um, one of the, <coughs> uh, this, this uh, United States Mexican film cooperation uh, uh, when silent film was replaced by sound is one of the most fertile moments uh, for the topic I'm discussing. Now you need to know a bit about the background. During the final years of the periodo mudo, the silent period, the effects of the ongoing Mexican revolu revolution of 1910 and also Hollywood's dominance had devastated Mexican film production. In 1923, only two Mexican films were produced. In 1924, zero Mexican films were produced. Now, Mexico was producing 20, 30 films in the 19-teens. So uh, by the end of the Mexican Revolution and the aftermath of the Rex Mexican Revolution and the imposition, the world hegemony, of American film, the domination of American film, Mexico had uh, essentially uh, no longer had a film industry by 1924. Not, not one movie uh, was made. <coughs> by, by the late 1920s, uh, Mexican film production had virtually disappeared. Uh, and in 1930, of the 244 movies that were exhibited in Mexico City, only four were Mexican movies. The other 240 movies were American movies uh, primarily. Uh, now sound changed the calculus radically. In the past, Hollywood's achieving dominance was not impeded by linguistic barriers because in the silent period, intertitles could easily be translated across languages and were. So Hollywood produced its movies in English, in Bengali, in French, in Spanish, in Swedish. It was no problem, really, because you were just translating the intertitles and they were sent to the right uh, country. Uh, now, with sound, the alternatives were much more difficult. One was to dub films into other languages, uh, el doblaje, uh, uh, which we still have uh, uh, as a worldwide phenomenon. But the technology for doing doblaje, for doing dubbing, effectively took about 10 years. It wasn't until 1939 that dubbing really became effective. Um, and I, I might add in passing that this technology uh, established Puerto Rico as the hemisphere's dubbing capital. And Puerto Rico still main, uh, maintains that uh, role as uh, la capital del doblaje, and del inglés español. A second alternative was to use non-English subtitles for foreign distribution. But this was not a good solution either since film's clientele worldwide included massive numbers of people, uh, analfabetos, who didn't, they didn't read, they were illiterate. Uh, and even among readers, the approach of looking at subtitles required some kind of, some kind of uh, uh, comfort level. At first, it seemed very novel and, uh, and unfamiliar. The third alternative is the one that Hollywood chose beginning in 1929, 1930, and that was to produce films in other languages, particularly Spanish and French, Italian and German, although Asian languages were done 
as well. So not too many people know this, but overall, Hollywood produced over 150 films in Spanish. And the studios tended to be run on a 24-hour basis with the morning eight hours filming uh, uh, the English version of Dracula and the second eight hours uh, filming the Spanish version of Dracula and the third eight hours filming the French or the German uh, version of Dracula with the same script, the same set, the same choreography, different crews, and different actors. In fact, I mentioned Dracula advisedly because the, the Spanish version of Dracula is better than the, than the English version of Dracula. Uh, quite a bit better and quite more recognized. Still available, you can get it at the, music, at the uh, Library of Congress. Um, now, it is, noticeable, it is notable that Mexico's first found film, Santa, 1932, was produced by personnel had, who had been active in Hollywood, Mexico, and directed, and two Mexican actors, both of